The other day, I was teaching about 50 political journalists about climate change. And they were absolutely shocked to learn that we could reach the two degree C climate threshold in 30 years or less. Now maybe 30 years sounds like a long time, but in infrastructure years, 30, 30 years is just the blink of an eye. Think, for example, how long it took to rebuild the Bay Bridge after the 1989 earthquake. But the reality is that we have to get off the path that we've been on, where carbon dioxide emissions that cause climate change continue to rise year after year. We have to bend the curve and drive emissions down to zero sometime in the latter half of the century. Now, what I would like to do is talk with you today about why I'm optimistic that we can deal with this challenge. But first, let's step back and take a look at the source of the emissions that cause global warming. About 76% of these carbon dioxide emissions come from energy, that is, burning fossil fuels. So that's the good news, and that's the bad news. And the bad news is that fossil fuels provide very reliable and relatively low cost energy that's really the backbone of our modern economy. So we can't afford to jeopardize that. But the good news we can see is that if we can eliminate the emissions from the energy sector, we've dealt with the lion's share of this problem. Now, 10 years ago, if you asked me whether we could reduce the energy system's emissions to zero, I would have said it's impossible. But the reality is that solar panels, wind turbines, lithium ion batteries, the prices for these zero emissions technologies has plummeted over the last, over the last decade. And in fact, these technologies now often provide the lowest cost source of electricity we have. And because of the low cost of lithium ion batteries, we can also now have electric cars, and we can use these same batteries to back up the electric grid when the wind's not blowing or the sun's not shining. So in fact, it should really come as no surprise that in some parts of the world, these technologies are being adopted very quickly. And in fact, there are many places where over 50% of all the electricity they use actually comes from these renewable resources. And something that I never thought that I would see in my lifetime, for the first time ever in the United States, for the entire electricity system, renewable energy generation topped coal. I never thought that I would see that in my lifetime. That's truly incredible. Yeah. I agree, that, that's truly incredible. So then I'm sure you're saying, well, why can't we go farther? And why can't we go faster? And why isn't everybody doing this? Well, the electricity system was built when we used, had coal plants and gas plants and you can turn them on when you want, and you can turn them off when you want, and you can control how much power they put out. But we can't control the wind, and we can't control the sun. So integrating these new technologies into the grid is like putting together a puzzle. All the pieces have to fit together in the right way. We need to figure out ways where we can figure out what is the right combination of wind resources and solar resources and battery electric storage. And how do we charge the tens of millions of electric vehicles that we're going to have? We need to figure out how to put the pieces of the puzzle together. And this, I'll tell you, is the forefront of innovation in energy technology today. And Stanford faculty are leaders in all of these areas and can bring their tremendous talents together to address these issues. I can tell you, here in Silicon Valley, you're sitting in the epicenter of energy innovation. 
here at Stanford and the Valley. There are over 1,700 energy-related companies in the Bay Area today. Who would have thought that just a decade ago? So grid operators are going to need much more data than they've had in the past to operate the grids reliably. And we're going to analyze, we're going to need to analyze this data in real time so we can optimize how all these pieces fit together. And we're going to need to send control signals to tens of millions of devices on the grid so that we can make this system work. This is the frontier of energy innovation. Due to the urgency of climate change and due to the availability of these low-cost solutions, many nations, states, counties, cities, corporations, and universities like Stanford are developing their own ambitious climate goals. And in fact, many have committed to 100% zero emission energy system. But they'll be the first ones to tell you they don't know how to get there. And that's where Stanford can help. We're working together with our partners to identify solutions that they can implement today and continue to implement further into the future so they too can get to zero emissions. A really good example is our work with the state of California. California has committed to 100% clean electricity by 2045. So we're using our models and computational algorithms to figure out what's the best combination of renewable generation, battery storage, combined with traditional generation to drive towards zero emissions, but at the lowest possible cost. And this is important because transitioning to zero emissions has to be affordable. Driving towards zero emissions, though, is not a linear process. It's a cycle. So just like diet and exercise are vital for human health, implementation and innovation are vital for the health of our planet. We call this platform of innovation and implementation zero emissions energy solutions. Now that's quite a mouthful, so I just like to call it Z's. And one of the best things about Z's is that the solutions we create together with our partners are made available through an open source toolkit so that everyone around the world can benefit from the solutions we develop. I'd like to switch now to thinking about the future, thinking about innovation in the future, and, and what the next 10 to 20 years looks like to us. I'm going to give you four examples. The first example will be about batteries. Stanford faculty are working on batteries that can store twice as much energy. So what does that mean? You can drive twice as far in your car, but maybe even more important, we'll be able to start to electrify heavy-duty trucking. And what about hydrogen? Hydrogen is the cleanest fuel. When you burn it, the only thing that comes out of your tailpipe is water. But making hydrogen from renewable energy today is just too expensive. So Stanford faculty are developing new materials and new processes so that we can make low-cost hydrogen from renewable energy. And what I show here is a sector that is often overlooked when we think about zero emissions, and that is the industrial sector. About 25% of carbon dioxide emissions come from the industrial sector, so we have to deal with this too. Iron and steel, cement, chemicals, aluminum, these are the materials of our modern economy. And today, we make them with fossil fuels. And unfortunately, we don't have a good substitute yet. So this is where carbon dioxide capture and storage comes in. We can capture the carbon dioxide from the smokestack before it ever gets into the atmosphere. We can purify it, and we could have, could, can put it back underground where it came from in the first place. And Stanford faculties are leaders in making sure that this can be done safely and effectively. And I'll give you just one more example. So imagine one day that we would be able to make liquid fuels like gasoline and diesel from renewable energy. Well, our faculty are working taking, for, taking carbon dioxide from the air, combining that with water, 
and making those exact same fuels that our economy relies on today. That would be a game changer. So I can tell you, we can actually do this in our laboratories today, but it's too expensive, way too expensive, and it's not very efficient. So discouraging, maybe. But what I want you to do is to think back to the 1970s when we first started manufacturing solar panels. They were way too expensive, and they weren't very efficient. But look at what a couple of decades of innovation has done. Solar energy is now some of the lowest cost energy in the world today. This is why I'm hopeful. Climate change is a complicated issue requiring multifaceted solutions. Yes, we need renewable energy, and yes, we need better batteries, and yes, we need electric cars, and yes, we need carbon dioxide capture and storage. And yes, we need to accelerate implementation of those technologies that are cost effective today. And yes, we need to continue to innovate because we still have lots of work to do. We need it all. That's what zero emissions energy solutions all are, are all about. And we here at Stanford are committing to, committed to ensuring that the innovations in our laboratories are implemented in the real world and that what we learn with our partners fuels the next cycle of innovation. Thank you.